Well, hello and uh, welcome to another lecture on biosignaling. This is biosignaling 2.2. Well, in, bio, in the previous lecture, biosignaling 2.1, I introduced the concept of molecular switches. I also talked about the uh, G proteins, uh, trimeric ones and uh, monomeric G proteins. Um, I talked about the catalytic mechanisms of, of uh, re uh, regulatory proteins, of G proteins, uh, for example, GAP and GFs. And uh, so in, in this lecture, Biosignaling 2.2, I'm going to talk about um, <coughs> two of the most common uh, switching mechanisms, which are phosphoration and dephosphoration mechanisms, and their required enzymes. So first I'm going to introduce uh, the concept of phosphoration, the reaction of phosphoration. Then I'm going to talk about the kinase enzymes, which are the uh, specific enzymes for phosphorating a protein. And then we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about dephosphorylation, which is another um, switching mechanism. And it's required enzyme, which is called the phosphatase enzyme. Okay, so the whole lecture is all about uh, just phosphorylation and dephosphorylation and the required enzymes. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, talk, uh, talk about the phosphorylation first. <coughs> well, um, Phosphorylation is the chemical reaction in which one phosphate group is transferred or is added to another biomolecule. Okay, so th that biomolecule, the target molecule, should not necessarily be a protein. It can be a phospholipid. Okay, for example, uh, <coughs> I, I introduced the concept of uh, IP3, uh, the, the, the second messengers, IP3, in situ triphosphate, and diisoglycerol as second messengers. And we saw that a phospholipid <coughs> inositol, uh, phosphatidyl inositol was um, phosphorylated several times until it, it was cleaved by a phospholipase C, uh, an enzyme, uh, into diisoglycerol and IP3. So a protein can get phosphorylated um, or be phosphorylated, uh, uh, an enzyme can get phosphorylated, um, even a phosph uh, Phospholipid can get phosphorylated. So, uh, generally, it's just the addition of a phosphate group to another bi biomolecule. One of the key uh, features of phosphorylation, or, or yeah, features of phosphorylation, let's say, is that, is that um, it can act as a switching mechanism. Well, I introduced the, the, the concept of switching. I told you that there are some intracellular signaling uh, proteins which, which are like switches, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, they have an honest state and off state, okay? In the honest state, we say that they're active, they can uh, make interactions with other effectors or other proteins. In the off state, they are inactive, and they can, uh, that means they're uh, deactivated and they can no longer um, uh, interact with other proteins, okay? So, um, so phosphorylation works as a switching mechanism. That means that the addition of that extra phosphate to that molecule may in some cases activate that molecule and in some other cases deactivate or inactivate that molecule. Okay, switch, uh, switch that molecule on or switch that molecule off. And this is what I mean by um, the fact that, you know, phosphorylation can act as a switching mechanism. Uh, but why? Why uh, just adding a phosphate group uh, to another, for example, let's imagine a protein or an enzyme, makes it activate, or activates that, or uh, or deactivates that. Well, it's because uh, it's because uh, the phosphorylation process uh, <clears throat> is going to cause some conformational changes in proteins. You know, a phosphate uh, a phosphate group has some negative charges, and when you add those uh, that phosphate group to that protein, you're basically adding more negative charges to that protein. And those negative charges are going to uh, break some ionic bonds and form new ionic bonds, and they're generally going to change the electrostatic interactions within that specific part of the protein or in the whole protein. And that change in the electrostatic interactions within different amino acid residues of a protein may cause uh, a conformational change or several conformational changes in, in a protein. And the conformational changes can be very small, okay, <clears throat> 
and happen in a very small uh, portion of the protein, or they can be radical and you know, they may change the whole uh, 3D structure of a protein. Okay, so this is why um, phosphorylation can act as a switching mechanism. So it may cause a conformational change. If the new conformation of a protein is a, conf is a, is a conformation in which uh, a protein can, can uh, make interactions with other proteins or other, molecule, other molecules, we said that that conformation change was activating, uh, activates um, the, the uh, protein. But if the conformation of change is a conformation or a state in which a protein is no longer able to make interactions with other proteins, well, we call it. Uh, we, we say that phosphorylation actually caused uh, caused uh, a deactivating uh, conformation of change. Okay, so this is how phosphorylation act as a switching mechanism. Sometimes turning on proteins, sometimes turning off. Phosphorylation. Um, can cause very strong interactions with hydrogen bond donors. You know, a phosphate can a phosphate group can form three or more um, hydrogen bonds, and these hydrogen bonds form a tetrahedral geometry like a pyramid. In that tetrahedral geometry, those hydrogen bonds are strongly uh, directional. Okay, are highly directional, and they can. Because they're highly directional, they can uh, make strong interactions in hydrogen bonds with hydrogen bond donors. Okay, and 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 the um, formation of those new hydrogen bonds can also be a reason for the conformation of changes induced by the phosphorylation as well. Okay, so um, this is this is there can be another reason why phosphorylation act as a switching mechanism. Hopefully. All the uh, you know modifications and conformational changes caused by phosphorylation are reversible. Well, I told you that switching off is as important as switching on, or sometimes switching on is as important as switching off. You know, we don't want um, a signaling uh, protein in the cell to be always on or always off. Okay, so we need a reversible switching mechanism. A good thing about phosphorylation is that it's a process in which it's reversible, okay? It means that when you add a phosphate, you can later uh, remove a phosphate, or when you remove a phosphate, you can later add another phosphate, so it is reversible. Another good thing about phosphate, or phosphorylation, sorry, is that it is enzyme controlled. It means that for adding a phosphate or removing a phosphate, you need an enzyme, you need a specific enzyme. That, uh, you know, it has several advantages. Well, uh, we have a specific enzymes for each phosphorylation reactions. You know, if you are, if you if you want to phosphorylate um, a specific amino acid, uh, for example, tyrosine, okay, you need a specific enzyme to add a phosphate to that tyrosine. So, because it is enzyme controlled, phosphorylation is a specific. And since it is um, enzyme controlled, enzymes actually are, uh, you know, can catalyze uh, a chemical reaction. So the efficiency and the, the, the speed of the reaction is increased just because it is enzyme controlled. So these are the advantage of uh, phosphorylation because, uh, just because it is enzyme controlled. It is controlled by specific enzymes. <sighs> phosphorylation can sometimes act as a docking site. You know, um, it, it was in biosignaling 1.2. Um, I explained the concept of signal, signaling complexes, and I told you that there is a, a specific a phosph a phospholipid, which is when, we, when it is uh, over-phosphorylated or hyper-phosphorylated, uh, that uh, phospholipid can act as a docking site for other signaling molecules or signaling proteins in the cell they can dock and they can activate other uh, effector proteins. And so phosphorylation uh, can act as a, as a, a docking site as well. Not just as a switching mechanism. Um, I just included this figure. I, you know, I, I, I myself don't like it, but this is a very schematic view. I just included here just to show you the uh, the very general idea uh, in phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. So we have a dephosphorylation, dephosphorylated protein. It means that it doesn't have any phosphate or extra phosphate. And then we are, we're going to have an enzyme called kinase, 
And a kinase enzyme is responsible for adding a phosphate group to, the, to, to a dephosphorylated protein, and it gets that phosphate from ATP, okay, adenosine triphosphate. And then we have phosphorylated protein, and then that phosphorylated protein is, uh, can turn back into uh, dephosphorylated pr uh, protein by an enzyme called uh, phosphatase. This phosphatase removes a, a phosphate from the phosphorylated protein and, gets, uh, and gives it to an ADP, okay? And now we have a dephosphorylated protein. It's not completely accurate, it's a very schematic view. I'm going to explain the exact mechanisms of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation and also the catalytic react, uh, uh, functions of kinase and uh, phosphatase enzymes. Yes, okay. Consequences of phosphorylation. I already talked about the consequences of phosphorylation. Um, deactivating or activating a protein, causing a conformation change, making a strong interactions with hydrogen bond donors, uh, causing a strong interactions with hydrogen bond donors. But let's, uh, it's good to review some real life examples. Well, the very first one is an example of phosphorylation as a docking site. Well, this is an uh, epidermal growth factor receptor. It has a kinase domain. And uh, a part of this kinase domain is phosphorylated. You see these phosphate groups. And uh, these, these phosphates act as a docking site and recruit other signal, uh, signaling proteins to that part so they can get activated by these kinase domain. Okay, so it can act as a docking site and, and, and uh, <clears throat> as an agent, agent which recruits other signaling uh, complexes or proteins into that area. Uh, in this case, you, you, we have a SARC uh, protein, and this is the active conformation. But you can see when uh, a, a phosphate is added, you see a rad somehow a radical uh, uh, conformation or change. And this uh, domain actually is, you know, uh, moves to this part. And here we have an inactive SARC just because uh, phosphorylation happens. So uh, phosphorylation. Uh, or the addition of, a, uh, of uh, uh, um, an extra phosphate to SARC um, causes a conformation change and inactivates or deactivates sorry, the uh, SARC enzyme. Here you can see um, an activation caused by uh, phosphorylation. You can see this is a, a extracellular signal regulated kinase, uh, kinase 2, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, this is the inactive conformation, but when a phosphate is added, um, it causes a conformation and change, and that conformation and change activates uh, uh, the enzyme. Sometimes uh, the, 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 the uh, inactive, uh, deactivation uh, is not only because of a conformation or change, but sometimes the phosphate can uh, make us a phosphosudu substrate. So, for example, this is an enzyme called um, glycogen synthesase, uh, synthase, sorry, synthesase, yeah, glycogen synthesase kinase 3 beta. This is active, okay, but <clears throat> look at this substrate here. Its substrate here uh, is actually uh, phosphorylated, and when it is phosphorylated, we call it uh, a phospho-sudu substrate. It's no longer the substrate, it's a sudu substrate because some amino acids or some parts of it are phos uh, phos uh, phosphorylated. And now this enzyme can no longer catalyze that or, or does any, uh, uh, you know, functions properly. Okay, so that's how uh, inactivation happens um, <coughs> uh, by creating a sudu substrate, a phospho-sudu substrate. So these are the, uh, some general consequences of phosphorylation. Phosphoamino acids. Among the 2022 amino acids, uh, only nine of them can get phosphorylated. And these are some of the examples. These are eight of them. Cysteine is not shown here. Uh, it's also a, uh, an amino acid which can get phosphorylated. Uh, so these nine, these eight amino acids plus cysteine, which is not shown here, 
Uh, so in total, nine amino acids can get phosphorylated. And um, among these, only three of them can make stable phosphoester bonds, okay? Uh, one of them is serine, the other one is threonine, and the last one is tyrosine. And when they get phosphorylated, we call them phosphoserine, phosphothreonine, and phosphotyrosine. These can, make, uh, can, uh, can form uh, stable phosphoester bonds, okay? The others uh, cannot, but histidine, arginine, uh, lysine, spartic, spotted, and glutamate, um, plus cysteine, they can also get phosphorylated. Okay, protein kinase, fun part. <laughs> protein kinase, okay. So what is protein kinase? I told you that, you know, I explained it, uh, phosphoration. I told you that, you know, uh, phosphoration is a process in which a phosphate is added to an auto molecule. So, is added. It means that, okay, is added by who? By what? By an enzyme, obviously. And that enzyme, which adds a phosphate to another protein or another molecule, is called the kinase enzyme. Um, in the case of a protein, you know, a kinase enzyme adds a phosphate to the hydroxyl uh, group of uh, specific amino acids, those nine amino acids I just showed you, um, just showed you, of, uh, you know, the, the um, hydroxyl group of specific amino acids on the target protein, okay? So it attaches phosphate to the hydroxyl group of a specific amino acids, those nine amino acids, on the target protein. We'll talk about it later. And this is how it does, uh, how it works. You know, this is signaling by phosphorylation, and this is, uh, we have this, uh, a schematic view of what happens in signaling by phosphorylation in the phosphorylation slide. It's basically showing that we have an we have a protein in the in the alpha state. The signals come in, activates um, a, a signal uh, gets in and activates a protein kinase. The protein kinase is going to add a phosphate to that, and now when it is phosphorylated it is turned on. When the signal gets out, fo uh, protein phosphatase is going to remove the extra phosphate and it turns back to the alpha state. This is beautiful. So I told you that a kinase is going to add a phosphate to the hydroxyl group of uh, specific amino acids. For example, this is tyrosine kinase. And this is a, a side chain of tyrosine. And you can see that this is a hydroxyl group and the kinase, uh, tyrosine kinase is going to add a, a phosphate to this hydroxyl group. Okay, and this is how a kinase works, although this is very, very schematic. I mean, super schematic. I'm going to actually show you some real um, molecular dynamics and protein dynamics. I'm going to show you the, uh, the exact ch uh, chemical reaction in which a, f uh, a kinase adds a phosphate to the substrate, okay? Uh, an important concept here, I just want to mention it here. Uh, is, a, is protein kinase cascade. If you remember in biocycline 1.2, I talked about some uh, common features of signal transduction pathways, and I told you that uh, one of the features was uh, amplification of a signal. You know, when a signal comes in, it activates uh, one enzyme, and then, and, and, th and then that one uh, single enzyme is going to activate several other enzymes, and each one of those activated enzymes are going to activate, uh, is going to activate other enzymes. So uh, this is how a signal is spread throughout the cell, and is, uh, this is how the signal is amplified. So uh, protein kinase cascade is, 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 is a real-life example of those enzymes which can amplify a signal. You know, when a signal comes in, uh, it, it may activate a protein kinase. That protein kinase, that one single protein kinase can activate a phosphorylated other uh, proteins, and each one of those proteins or enzymes, they can be enzymes, uh, may activate other enzymes or proteins. And, and this is how protein kinase cascade helps to spread the signal out in the cell and, and amplify it. Okay, so, yeah, just wanted to mention that here. Kinase superfamily. Uh, it is really a superfamily, and we have uh, several kinds of uh, 
Kanye's enzymes. I'm not going through the whole table here. Um, and I'm, of course, I'm, uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to explain every single uh, one of them. Um, uh, protein kinase A, I'm going to explain protein kinase A. I'm going to explain uh, calcium calmodulin kinase, calcium calmodulin dependent kinase, actually in the next lecture. I'm going to talk about tyrosine kinase, yes. And yeah, I'm going to talk about some of these um, kinase enzymes. But I just included this table just to show you that we have a super family of kinase enzymes. And, you know, uh, because each one of them is, uh, is a specified um, or specialized in catalyzing a, uh, a unique phosphorylation mechanism. Sorry, a unique phosphorylation um, reaction. Okay, okay. Where does that phosphate come from? I mean, um, I told you that, you know, phosphorylation is the process of adding a phosphate to another molecule, to another molecule. The kinase, the enzyme catalyzes that, which catalyzes the, that reaction. Okay, so where's the source of that extra phosphate? Well, then it's in triphosphate, of course. Adenosine triphosphate ATP, a very, very common molecule and source of energy. I'm not really happy with this notion that it is a source of energy. But anyway, it's a source of phosphate. Okay. So adenosine triphosphate, this is the general structure of it. We have an adenine attached to a ribose, a sugar molecule, and this is attached to three phosphate groups. And these... And these, uh, you know, these are called one, two, three. I want to call them, or in 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 uh, some texts, they're called uh, alpha, beta, and gamma phosphates. And I'm going to call them alpha, beta, and gamma. Between the sugar and the very first, or the alpha phosphate, we have an ester bond. And between the first and the second, and the second and the third, we have anhydride bonds. This is the these are the bond. These uh, anhydride bonds are the uh, energy containing bonds, okay? <clears throat> so we have three phosphates, thus we call it adenosine triphosphate, three. When we remove or hydrolyze one of these phosphates, we're, we end up with adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates. And if you remove two of them, well, we're gonna end up with adenosine monophosphate, one phosphate. <sighs> uh, let's talk about I want to show you something about the hydrolysis of ATP. This is the ATP. For hydrolysis, of course, we need water. So water comes in. Um, so one of these phosphates, the gamma phosphate, is released. Here it is. And we also have this little proton, or hydrogen ion. So uh, a hydrogen ion is released, and this um, hydroxyl group, and the already... Um, oxygen and hydrogen of water is attached to this phosphate and now this phosphate is removed or hydrolyzed. Sorry I'm explaining like this, you know, I know you are all professors and uh, you know I'm just reviewing, reviewing this uh, material for, for myself but uh, you know this is what I love, this is what I'm passionate about, you know, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm I'm explaining them in, in, in this manner. So I apologize you know, uh, for, for explaining these materials in this manner. You know, I'm not explaining them to you. I'm just reviewing these, uh, these concepts for myself. Okay? And that's why I'm, I'm, because I'm passionate about them, that's why I'm so uh, excited. Okay? Um, an important note about uh, ATP is that ATP is thermodynamically unstable because of the gamma and beta phosphate. But it's kinetically stable. ATP, so you may ask why um, uh, ATP is not hydrolyzed um, in a normal condition and why it requires uh, a, 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 an enzyme to be hydrolyzed or to be transferred 
uh, to transfer one of its phosphate to another protein? Well, uh, it's because of the electrostatic repulsion of water molecules surrounding the ATP molecules in the cytoplasm, okay, or cytosol. That's why. <coughs> Although it is thermodynamically unstable, but uh, because of those electrostatic repulsions of water molecules, uh, polar wa water molecules, ATP cannot easily transfer one of its phosphates. So it re require an enzyme, uh, kinase enzyme, to remove uh, the, uh, the, the gamma phosphate and uh, attach it to another, to another molecule or substrate. <sighs> Things kinase should do in order to get a phosphate from ATP and give it to another substrate. First, it should bind to ATP. Then, it should coordinate two magnesium ions. This is very important. Um, sorry. You know, in the case of phosphoration, in this reaction, we have um, two types of molecules. We have an electrophilic one and a nucleophilic one. Phil uh, is, a, is, is a suffix, it means that, you know, um, uh, loving or, uh, you know, hydrophilic, it means that it's a substrate which, which loves water. Phobic is the opposite one. And, uh, <coughs> Again, I'm re reviewing these concepts for myself. Um, so, electrophilic is a, is, a, is, a, is a molecule which wants to get electrons. It loves electrons, of course. Nucleophilic is a, is a molecule or, sub, or, or something or a substance which wants to donate electrons. Um, a kinase uh, enzyme should coordinate two magnesium ions in order to make the... Um, uh, the gamma phosphate of ATP more electrophilic, and the phosphate of ATP is electrophilic. It, it means that it wants electrons. And these two cord, uh, magnesium ions are just there uh, to make the gamma phosphate more electrophilic. It should reduce the repulsion of some oxygen groups of the substrate. It should bind to the substrate. It should bring nucleophil nucleophile and the electrophile within the 4.5 angstroms. This range, 4.5 angstroms, is very important. The distance between the nucleophile and electrophile, the nucleophile, uh, nucleophile is the substrate which is going to be phosphorylated. The electrophile is the gamma phosphate of ATP. They should be brought to this uh, range of 4.5 angstroms. The distance between the nucleophile and electrophile should not exceed the 4.5 angstroms. This is very important. This is one of the, the most important thing, I guess, a kinase does. Because a kinase, is, after all, is, is, a, is like a scaffold, okay, for just bringing these two together. It should also render the nucleophile more nucleophilic. It should remove the uh, phosphorated substrate after it is phosphorylated. And it should replace ADP with ATP, so it is ready for another uh, phosphoration. Uh, beautiful about proteins uh, is that, for example, kinase, beautiful about enzymes, of course, and other proteins, is that a kinase does all of these things by just, uh, by just precisely positioning specific amino acids in its uh, catalytic site. And it's catalytic cleft, for example. This is wonderful. So now let's see that in action. So this is a... This shows a process of phosphoration. And we have an enzyme and substrate, okay? We have a substrate here, okay? Good. Okay, so this is one... Sorry, this is one, this is the second, this is the very first, and this is the second magnesium ion. So we have two magnesium ions, I told you, that it sh uh, the kinase should coordinate two magnesium ions. And look at these two magnesium ions. They're making this uh, gamma phosphate of ATP more electrophilic, okay? So, 
In this state, this substrate, it's nu uh, the substrate is nucleophilic. It means that it wants to donate an electron, or a pair of electrons, actually. So it donates an, uh, a pair of electrons to this gamma phosphate, and this electron donation causes the bond between the gamma and beta phosphate to be broken. When this bond is broken, we have an intermediate state. And after that, in the enzyme product state, when the product is complete, is completed. You can, see, you can see that the bond between the gamma phosphate and the beta phosphate is completely broken, and now the phosphate is attached to the product, or the substrate. And we, can see, we can say that uh, a phosphate transfer happened, or uh, uh, this product or substrate is phosphorylated. So this is how uh, a kinase, a protein kinase, catalyzes the, the uh, attachment or the addition of a phosphate to a product or substrate. Basically all it does is to bring the nucleophile, which is the substrate, and the electrophile, which is the gamma phosphate of, of, of ATP, into, uh, into this uh, 4.5 angstrom range. Okay? And, and, and the uh, kinase enzyme puts these two in this uh, in, in, in close proximity of each other and, and so that they can so that the nucleophile or the substrate can donate the pair of electrons uh, to the uh, gamma phosphate and the bond between the gamma and beta phosphate of ATP is broken and the uh, gamma phosphate is is uh, is now transferred to the substrate and the substrate is uh, uh, Phosphorylated. Okay, so this is how this is how it works. I love it. I love these uh, uh, exact. I love to understand the exact mechanism of enzymes and proteins and how they work. It's beautiful. Okay, let's talk about uh, protein kinase A. Protein kinase A is a type of is one of the uh, families of uh, kinase enzymes and uh, it has a specific uh, structure. So this is the schematic structure. This is an inactive, this is inactive protein kinase A. I'm going, I'm, uh, I just want to, uh, you know, tell you how, why it is inactive and how it is activated. Well, let's take a look at this structure, schematic structure of course. We have regulatory subunits, one and two. So we have two regulatory subunits, and we have one and two catalytic subunits. The function of these regulatory subunits uh, is that they attach to these catalytic subunits and prevent, them, prevent the catalytic subunits uh, to make interactions and to uh, get activated. Okay. So, until these regulatory subunits are attached to the catalytic subunits, catalytic subunits are going to stay inactive and they can not actually interact with other proteins. So what detaches these uh, uh, regulatory subunits? CAMP. So I kill a KMP, I introduce that, it's a second messenger, it acts as a, as a key. Okay, so when cyclic AMP is released in the cell, look at these two holes, okay? These holes are called cyclic nucleotide binding pockets or binding sites, okay? And we have two CAMP binding sites in each uh, regulatory subunit. So in order to release these two catalytic subunits, we need four of these cyclic AMPs, okay? two for one and two, two for the other. So these two cyclic AMPs, I told you they act as a key, okay? And they cause a confirmation of change in the regulatory subunit. And that confirmation of change uh, causes the regulatory subunits, uh, you know, <clears throat> the cyclic AMPs causes a confirmation of change in, in, in uh, regulatory subunits. 
And uh, thanks to that confirmation change, these regulatory subunits can no longer bind to the catalytic subunits. And now you can see the catalytic subunits are active and they can go on and, and um, do their stuff. They can, um, uh, you know, activate other enzymes, other kinase enzymes, or, or uh, effectors or proteins. Okay? Let's take a look, uh, take a deeper look on the conformational change caused by these two, um, these uh, cyclic AMPs, okay, that caused the detachment of regulatory subunits from, from uh, catalytic subunits. So you can see, uh, I'm going to talk about the dimerization domain and um, A kinase anchoring protein binding site. I'm going to talk about them later, but this is, uh, this is, this part, these, this one, sorry, my pointer is funny today. So this one and this one, these are the regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, okay? I told you we have two cyclic nucleotide binding sites in each one of those regulatory subunits. So we have C and B, cyclic nucleotide binding site A and B in one of these one of those regulatory subunits, and we have C and A and C and B, um, C and B A, C and B A, uh, B in the other in the another one. Okay. Now let's see what happens when um, a CAMP uh, <clears throat> binds to these regulatory subunits and how it causes them to detach uh, from uh, the catalytic subunits. Here you can see this. You, you see this. This uh, uh, Jesus. You see this uh, gray conformation here. This is the active conformation. Okay. Um, it means that active inhibitory conformation. It means that uh, it's a conformation in which regulatory subunits are actively inhibiting. Um, uh, the catalytic subunits and preventing them to uh, to be active and to go on and act on other effector proteins. When uh, a cyclic AMP binds to one of these um, cyclic nucleotide binding sites, you see this is a, a glutamic acid 200. Okay, one of the amino acids here. And this arginine, arginine, uh, yeah, gl it's glutamic acid. So it's glutamic acid 200 and this arginine uh, 209 or 209. These two amino acid residues in this uh, uh, nucleotide binding pocket, cyclic nucleotide binding pocket, may form some bonds with this CAMP, okay? And as a result of these uh, two bonds, these newly formed bonds, a conformational change happens. And, and the new conformation is, the, is this uh, blue region, okay? So this uh, gray region is the uh, active inhibitory conformation, but this blue region is the inactive inhibitory conformation when CAMP is bound, okay? So basically, uh, or generally, CAMP forms uh, <clears throat> two bonds with glutamic acid and arginine, two amino acid residues. And these uh, two bonds causes a conformational change in this um, in this part. And as a result of this conformational change, the inhibitory, the, the, the regulatory subunit can no longer bind to the catalytic subunit, okay? So the catalytic subunit is released and um, it's activated and it can go on and activate other enzymes or other proteins and uh, effector molecules or proteins. Okay, so this is how it works. Uh, and this is how CAMP acts as a key uh, to detach these regulatory subunits from these catalytic subunits. Protein kinase a domains. Well, um, this is an example of a, a eukaryotic protein kinase A. This is an, this is an example of a, a prokaryotic uh, 
protein kinase A, you can, you can see the difference and you can see that uh, the prokaryotic one is a little bit simpler, uh, and less complicated and less complex than the eukaryotic one. But I included these two just to show you that um, the kinase domain has a catalytic cleft. The kinase domain of a protein kinase A has a catalytic cleft. This catalytic cleft is enclosed by two lobes. Okay, two lobes. The first one is the N lobe or N terminal lobe or N terminus lobe. The other one is a C terminal lobe or C lobe. Okay. This is the N lobe here, and this is the C lobe. What do they do? And this is the catalytic cleft of protein kinase A. The N lobe coordinates the ATP by a, a, a glycine-rich P loop. So it has the N lobe has a glycine-rich P, uh, P loop, which coordinates the ATP. Of course, we need ATP as a phosphorus uh, as a phosphate source. What does C lobe do? Well, C lobe also coordinates ATP, but specifically the gamma phosphate of ATP. Okay. CELO is, um, is the main site for substrate binding, okay? So substrate binds to the CELO, the substrate which is going to be phosphorated. And it also carries this uh, spartic acid, or D, catalytic uh, spartic acid residue. And this, the role of this catalytic residue, or spartic acid, is to make the uh, nucleophile more, yeah, the nucleophile or the substrate more nucleophilic. You know how? It removes a proton, on, a proton uh, or hydrogen ion, okay, from the substrate. So when we remove a positive charge from the substrate, we are actually uh, making it more nucleophilic because it wants to donate an electron, the extra negative charge it has, okay? so. The role of this catalytic uh, spotic acid here um, is to just make the uh, substrate more nucleophilic, okay? I just included this one just to show you this, these two figures just to show you the N lobe and the C lobe, okay? Uh, protein kinase A, again protein kinase A, what I'm going to tell you here is that, you know, when protein kinase A is synthesized, it's ca it is catalytically incompetent. It means that um, it's not ready for uh, catalyzing the phosphorylation reaction. <sighs> Immediately after the synthesis, protein kinase A undergoes two phosphorylation reactions. The first one happens in the C terminus in this uh, serine amino acid here. The other one happens somewhere here in the activation segment in the in the threonine in, in one of the uh, threonine um, amino acid residues here. Okay, so you can see this is this is an incompetent, uh, inactive uh, conformation. These, uh, you know, so it undergoes two phosphorylation re uh, reactions: one in the serine uh, amino acid in the C terminus, and the other one uh, is in a, in a uh, threonine amino acid in this. Uh, activation segment, and after that, it is now competent and active. It is now in the competent and active segment. The result of these two phosphorylation, rea uh, phosphorylation uh, reactions is that uh, you know important rearrangements are, uh, happen in in both N lobe and the C lobe. So. Uh, the N lobe and the C lobe, both of them uh, undergo important uh, rearrangements or uh, conformation or changes, and they make uh, a competent, active protein kinase A. Okay? Some rearrangements happen also in the uh, substrate binding part, uh, uh, binding uh, segment, and also in the activation segment as well as the N lobe. Okay? What do we have here? Well, we have competent but inactive uh, protein kinase A. 
Why inactive, you may ask? It is competent. Well, we have this regulatory subunit attached to it. So this is a regulator, this is part of that regulatory subunit, okay? And this regulatory subunit has uh, an inhibitory sequence, okay? It has an inhibitory sequence here, which is blocking the catalytic uh, cleft, as you see, or the activation segment or the substrate binding segment, okay? So, and this, um, <clears throat> yeah, this is the regulatory subunit, and it's actually keeping the uh, protein kinase a in, in its uh, inactive state and you can see when CAMP is added okay um, this is removed and now we have a competent and active uh, protein kinase A. Sometimes two protein kinase A's um, can form dimerizations for example this is uh, protein kinase AC, two of protein kinase ACs and uh, they, they have a dimerization domain and the role of this dimerization domain is that it, 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 is, um, it binds to another protein called A kinase anchoring protein. And this AKAP anchors protein kinase A or this uh, whole enzyme or dimer, uh, uh, yeah, whole enzyme or dimer, uh, dimer uh, or this dimer to for example, the nuclear membrane or, or the membrane of other organelles in which these enzymes are needed. Okay, so we, uh, the, sometimes protein kinase A's form whole enzymes or dimer, dimers and they have a dimerization domain and this dimerization domain uh, binds to uh, A kinase anchoring protein and the role of these uh, AKAP is to anchor the protein kinase or that dimer or that whole enzyme to some uh, to the membrane of some organelles, okay, uh, and uh, wherever wherever the 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 uh, protein kinase A is needed, okay. So this is the uh, the the action of the role of a um, AKAP and uh, the dimerization domain. Uh, yeah, okay. Now I'm going to. Sorry. I'm going to explain a relatively simple uh, signal transduction pathway, which includes uh, what happens in that signal transduction pathway is that we're going to have a rise in CAMP. And we are going to see how this rise in CAMP, how the production of, uh, of second messenger CAMP in the cell, is going to cause an alteration in gene transcription. It's beautiful. So this is a, a relatively simple, uh, somehow linear uh, signal transduction pathway. We have some very um, familiar uh, structures and um, molecules here. We have a signal molecule this signal molecule attaches to a G-protein copper receptor. It causes a confirmation change in G-protein copper receptor. It activates the G-protein copper receptor. This G-protein copper receptor, in turn, activates the alpha subunit of stimulatory, stimulatory G-protein. This uh, alpha subunit of the stimulatory G-protein is going to activate analyzed cyclase, the same enzyme, the enzyme required for the production of CAMP from ATP. So ATP goes in and analyzed cyclase produces uh, CAMP or cyclic AMP. And as I told you, we have uh, an inactive protein kinase A and CAMP acts as a key, okay? And it causes the detachment of, of, of uh, these um, regulatory subunits from the catalytic subunits and now these catalytic subunits of protein kinase A are active okay and they can uh, translocate it to uh, they can be translocated to the uh, to the inside of the cell cells uh, nucleus and there they're going to activate some transcription factors I'm not going through um, everything about this uh, CREP transcription factor or cyclic AMP response element or uh, these um, uh, genetic agents, I'm actually going to explain them in implicit and explicit memory lectures, so I'm not going through all of them for the sake of time and for the sake of this lecture. For this lecture, I'm not going through them and not, I'm not going to explain them, okay? 
but I'm going to definitely explain them later in, in uh, implicit and explicit memory lectures. But basically, this um, the catalytic, the activated catalytic subunit of the protein kinase A is going to activate some uh, transcription factors and recruit other trans or the you know other uh, transcription factors, and um, we're going to activate a target gene, and uh, we have gene transcription. So this is how one single signal molecule, okay, causes a an alteration in the gene transcription. This is beautiful. And this is very schematic, of course, and very simple, linear uh, signal transduction pathway, but um, I just included that this uh, slide just to review uh, some concepts and just to show how they're all related to each other. The G protein copper receptor, the uh, alpha subunit of a stimulatory G protein, the analyzed cyclase, cyclic AMP, catalytic subunit of protein kinase A and how protein kinase A is translocated into the cell membrane and it activates other transcription factors and so on. Okay, so this is, uh, this is it. Okay, I love this slide. The receptors for uh, growth factors, uh, epidermal growth factor, and transforming growth factor beta, uh, these receptors for these, uh, the receptors for these specific uh, receptor, uh, uh, growth factors are enzyme couple receptors. And they have intrinsic um, kinase domains on their cytosolic um, sites. First, let's um, talk about the transforming growth factor beta uh, receptor. Uh, this growth factor, transforming growth factor beta, uh, binds to type 1 receptor and type 2 receptors. Okay, binds to both of these receptors. Type 1 receptor uh, signals into the cell, okay, but it's inactive. Type 2 receptor is active or gets activated when uh, <coughs> TGF or transforming growth factor binds to it, but it is only active to make the uh, signaling kinase uh, or uh, the first type receptor, uh, type 1 receptor active. Okay, so type 1 receptor signals into the cell, but it's inactive. Type 2 receptor is active, but just to activate the type 1 receptor, okay? Now let's see why type 1 receptor uh, is inactivated, deactivated, sorry, uh, and how this uh, type 2 receptor activates type 1 receptor. Well, <clears throat> there are some wedges, okay, some amino acids distorting the um, end lobe of type 1 receptor. So I told you type 1 receptor is a kinase, so it has an end lobe and a C lobe. Some wedges, some amino acid residues, distort the end lobe of type 1 receptor. And as a result of that, I told you that the end lobe coordinates the ATP. And these wedges, which distort the end lobe of type 1 receptor, they, 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 don't, they do not allow the uh, the end lobe to correctly coordinate ATP. Okay. In the case of a transforming growth factor beta receptor, we have uh, a glycine serine uh, rich domain here, shown here. Okay. So this is a glycine serine rich domain, or GS domain. And this GS, okay distorts the, a, uh, the end lobe, okay, so this is the uh, end lobe and the C lobe, this is the hinge connecting these two lobes, and we have here, this one, this part, is the glycine serine rich domain, which distorts the uh, end lobe, okay, so that end lobe cannot correctly coordinate ATP. So what happens then when, um, 
the uh, transforming growth factor or the signal or the ligand binds to receptor type 2. A receptor type 2 or type 2 receptor is, you know, phosphorylates this uh, glycine serine rich domain, okay? It phosphorylates this GS domain. And as a result of this phosphorylation, this GS domain is detached from the end lobe. And now the end lobe can, co uh, can correctly coordinate the ATP. And now it is active. Okay, so you can see it's very beautiful. You can see the type 2 receptor um, actually phosphorylates the GS domain. Okay, and a result, as, a, as a result of this phosphorylation, it, it is detached from the end lobe, and now the end lobe can, co uh, can correctly coordinate ATP and it is active. And it can signal into the cell and phosphorate other, uh, phosphorate other uh, effectors and other kinase enzymes or other enzymes or proteins. We have epidermal growth factor receptor. The epidermal growth factor is, uh, is a growth factor uh, necessary for cell differentiation and cell growth. It also binds to two receptors, receptor 1 and receptor 2. Again, receptor 1 is inactive and receptor 2, uh, the role of receptor 2 is to activate receptor 1. Now, this is what happens. There are some amino acid residues which wedge into the end lobe again of the receptor of, of type 1 receptor, okay? And they distort the end lobe, okay? There, basically, there are two leucine amino acid residues, two leucines, okay? Which they, um, they actually distort the end lobe, okay? They basically distort the position of the alpha C helix. Okay, so there are two leucine residues. They distort the position of an of a alpha C helix. What happens when uh, epidermal growth factor binds to the type one type two receptor? The C lobe of type two receptor is going to push the end lobe of type one receptor. So this is the C lobe. This is the C lobe of type 2 receptor. It, sorry, it pushes the, the end lobe of type 1 receptor. As a result of that, it pushes those two leucine amino acid residues away. The alpha C helix can swing inward. And now, a glutamic acid residue which is necessary to coordinate the ATP, is facing the ATP and magnesium ion, so, so the end lobe can now coordinate the ATP correctly. So again, the C lobe of, um, of type 2 receptor pushes on the end lobe of type 1 receptor. As a result of this pushing, it pushes those two distorting... Um, uh, leucine amino acids away, the uh, alpha C helix swings inward, and now the glutamic acid, uh, 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 a glutamic acid residue or um, amino acid residue, uh, is is now facing the ATP and the magnesium ion, so that the end lobe can actually correctly coordinate the ATP, and that glutamic acid um, is important for uh, the correct coordination of ATP in the ATP binding pocket of of the kinase. This is how uh, epidermal growth factor and trans uh, transforming growth factor beta receptors are activated. And these are uh, related to kinase enzymes and these are receptors of course but they are enzyme coupled receptors. They have, an, they're ha they're ha they have an intrinsic uh, kinase domain under cytosolic site. Beautiful. I, I, I enjoy, I, I, I really enjoy these, uh, studying these, uh, you know, small things um, about the activation and deactivation, about the catalytic mechanisms of enzymes and proteins. Very beautiful. Okay. Receptor tyrosine kinase, another uh, 
and dime copper receptor. This one is a receptor for insulin. Insulin. So these two are, are kinase domains here on the cytosolic uh, side. This is the inactive kinase part or kinase domain of this uh, recept uh, tar receptor tyrosine kinase. The reason it is inactivated uh, or inactive, sorry, is that there is an activation loop, okay? There's an activation loop which is forming, um, I mean, two amino acids are forming some hydrogen bonds here. When it is phosphorylated, this is how phosphorylation or, or the addition of uh, the extra phosphate is actually making, um, uh, activating um, a kinase protein. When that activation loop is phosphorylated, it undergoes a large displacement, a large conformation change. It changes its position by 13 angstrom, angstroms. Okay, so a, uh, it undergoes a, uh, somehow, uh, you know, um, a radical uh, conformational change, and now the activation loop, when it is in this conformation, um, this aspartic acid, which is the catalytic residue, is open to uh, catalyze other enzymes, other uh, the phosphorylation of other uh, proteins. Okay, so so the concept is very simple. There is an activation loop, and um, two hydrogen bonds between uh, two amino acids are holding that activation loop in that conformation, uh, in that conformation, or in that inactive state. And when that um, phosphorylation happens, those two hydrogen bonds are broken, and that activation loop undergoes a radical conformation change or displacement by 13 angstroms. And now the, uh, the activation segment is ready for uh, catalyze phosphorylation reaction or reactions. <sighs> Remember I talked about desensitization to an external signal molecule. It was in uh, biosignaling 1.2, I guess. I don't remember, biosignaling 1.1 or 1.2. But anyway, um, so this one, I'm going to talk about this one. You so see, this is receptor inactivation. And I told you that this receptor inactivation can be caused by the phosphorylation. By, by phosphorating the, the receptor. And now I'm going to talk about how uh, phosphorylation of a receptor is actually going to make the receptor inactive. <sighs> Back to G-protein copper receptors. Well, we have a G-protein copper receptor, okay? Here it's, uh, it's in the, um, the active conformation it can activate uh, the alpha subunit of a stimulatory or inhibitory G protein, okay? And then uh, the alpha subunit can go and, and uh, activate effectors and uh, finally cause a response. But we have a G protein copper receptor kinase. We have a G protein copper receptor kinase enzyme, GRK. This GRK can phosphorylate, okay? can phosphorylate this uh, G-protein copper receptor. When this G-protein copper receptor is phosphorylated, okay, you, you can see these two phosphates, by GRK, or G-protein copper receptor kinase enzyme, a protein, that, that phosphorylation, that, those two, uh, extra phosphates can act as a docking site for another protein called Aristi. The aristine can uh, recruit uh, some signaling uh, proteins which are necessary for the uh, mitogen activated protein kinase pathway, the very common pathway, but I'm not going to talk about that. Aristine is actually going to facilitate the endocytosis of this phosphorylated uh, G protein copper receptor via clathrin coated pits, okay? 
And when it is endocy endocyto uh, when it is when endocytosis happens, it can recycle back uh, uh, in that uh, vesicle or in that uh, clathrin coated pit. Uh, the phosphorylated uh, G protein copper receptor it is detached from uh, its signal, okay, or, or its ligand, and it can recycle back to the membrane, or it can progress toward the destructive uh, lysosomes, and it can be uh, it is uh, going to be destroyed by lysosomes, okay. So we have a G protein copper receptor kinase enzyme. It phosphorylates a receptor, okay? And this is how ph phosphorylation of a receptor causes that uh, receptor to, uh, to become inactive, okay? Causes the deactivation of, a, of the receptor. This phosphorylated um, protein kinase enzyme can act as a docking site for aristine. This aristine can facilitate the endocytosis of this protein kinase enzyme via clathrin clathrin coated pits, and these vesicles or these pits can actually um, recycle back this uh, uh, G protein copper receptor to uh, back to the membrane, or uh, or this uh, G protein copper receptor can actually uh, progress toward the destructive lysosomes and be destroyed. Okay, so. Uh, that was all I wanted to talk about kinase enzymes. In the next part of this lecture, I'm going to talk about the phosphorylation, uh, the 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 phosphorylation, the uh, the, uh, the chemical reaction, which is the opposite of phosphorylation, which is uh, I mean the the uh, the removal of, of a phosphate from a phosphorylated substrate. Okay. Okay. So um, I talked about the phosphorylation and the uh, kinase enzyme. One important note, I want to correct what I said um, about the tyrosine, uh, receptor tyrosine kinase. I told you that the activation loop undergoes a conformation change or uh, is, its position is displaced by 13 angstrom, but it is actually 30 angstroms, okay, so 30. Uh, sorry about that, I confused it. Um, I was a little bit confused. So uh, <clears throat> the activation loop uh, moves by 30 angstroms, and there's, uh, uh, you know, 30 angstroms, uh, uh, radical conformation change. Okay, so that was what I wanted to correct about. <sighs> protein phosphatase. Let's talk about protein phosphatase. Well, <clears throat> um, protein phosphatase is, a, is, is, is the name of an enzyme, uh, or a group of enzymes which uh, catalyze a reaction which is the opposite of phosphorylation or uh, you know the reaction is dephosphorylation. As I told you phosphorylation is the reaction in which one phosphate is added to an other molecule. Dephosphorylation obviously is a reaction in which a phosphate is removed from the substrate or phosphorylated substrate. Dephosphorylation, just like phosphorylation, can be a stimulatory or inhibitory. For example, here you can see an enzyme, okay, which is the inactive, uh, in the inactive state, okay, and <clears throat> this enzyme uh, you know, it is, the, uh, it is in the inactive state, okay, when it is phosphorylated, it's, it is activated, okay? It is phosphorylated by a, uh, by a kind of kinase called uh, serine or threonine kinase, okay? And when it is phosphorylated, okay, when these uh, phosphate uh, groups are attached to it, uh, <clears throat> it becomes active. And now, it can be dephosphorylated by serine and threonine phosphatase, and when it is dephosphorylated, uh, dephosphorylation actually uh, deactivates this enzyme. Okay, so here it has an inhibitory uh, action. Phos dephosphorylation has an inhibitory uh, role. But sometimes you see that in this example, um, 
this is phosphorylated, but this phosphorylated protein, uh, because it is phosphorylated, it is inactive, okay? And when it is dephosphorylated by uh, <clears throat> tyrosine phosphatase, when this uh, extra phosphate is removed, it undergoes a conformation change and it is actually activated, okay? So uh, in this case, uh, dephosphorylation acts as a, as a, uh, as a stimulatory uh, reaction, okay? So just like phosphorylation, dephosphorylation can sometimes switch some proteins or enzymes or other biomolecules on. It can also some, uh, sometimes, in some cases, uh, turn uh, some proteins off, switch them off. There are two broad families of protein phosphatase enzymes. We have a protein tyrosine phosphatase, PTP, and also we have protein serine or th and threonine phosphatase, or PPP. Well, uh, these are different classes of these two broad gene families, and each one of them have different, uh, you know, conformations and different 3D structures, thus, and, and they also act on different substrates. So there are two different dephosphorylation mechanisms, and let's talk about those dephosphorylation mechanisms by uh, PTP and PPP. So protein ty tyrosine phosphatase, uh, this is the structure. There's a catalytic pocket, and this catalytic pocket is characterized by three loops, the PTP loop, the Q loop here, and a, a WPD loop, okay? And there's a catalytic residue, which is, uh, which is a cysteine, uh, 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 a catalytic amino acid residue, which is a cysteine 215 here. And there are two bonding sites for phosphotyrosine. The first one is in the catalytic pocket, okay, here, near the catalytic uh, residue. And this is the substrate, or, which is the phosph uh, phosphotyrosine. Uh, the phosphotyrosine is, uh, is a tyrosine of a target molecule which has been uh, phosphorylated by, uh, by kinase, okay? And now it is a substrate for uh, protein tyrosine or phosphotyrosine phosphatase, okay? It's now here to, uh, uh, to dephosphorate or uh, <coughs> the, the, extra, uh, the extra phosphate uh, is going to be removed. There is another bonding site for this, uh, for the substrate, uh, which is here at this loop, okay, which is connecting the alpha two helix uh, to alpha one helix, okay. So there is a loop connecting these two helices, uh, helices, and uh, this loop also has a, a site for bond, uh, for for the substrate, okay. So here you can see the um, the catalytic pocket. And this is a tyrosine, a phosphotyrosine, okay, uh, of the substrate um, uh, protein or the target protein. And in this area, we have the catalytic residue or cysteine 215. You can see that this catalytic, uh, you know, the depth of this catalytic pocket, uh, catalytic pocket is 9.2 angstroms, around 9.2, 9.2 to 10 angstroms. And it is deep enough. Uh, so that the substrate or tyrosine can actually uh, contact this, this catalytic residue or cysteine. But here we have a phosphoserine, okay? This is a tyrosine, but here we have a phosphoserine. And you can see that the catalytic pocket is too deep for the phosphoserine, okay? And this is one of the reasons, uh, actually the main reason that uh, PTP, sorry, PTP or phosphotyrosine um, or protein tyrosine phosphatase is specifically uh, <coughs> designed for uh, dephosphorating uh, phosphotyrosine, okay? So only phosphotyrosine can actually reach this catalytic domain within this deep, uh, depth, okay? And the catalytic, domain, uh, catalytic cleft is too deep for phosphoserine or phosphothreonine, uh, uh, okay, to contact this catalytic cleft, uh, catalytic residue or cysteine, okay? Now let's see how PTP catalyzes the uh, dephosphorylation. So, first of all, uh, there are, 
you know, we have a, a, a single step phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, and, and, and a, a two step dephosphorylation, two step dephosphorylation. The catalytic mechanism of PTP actually requires two steps. In the very first step, you see, this is, I told you, this is uh, cysteine 215. Um, this catalytic residue has a low pKa of around 5.4, okay? So, and it, it also has a, a sulfhydryl group, okay? So this catalytic residue has, this cysteine has a sulfhydryl group, and because it has a low pKa of around 5.4, it, it, it acts as a nucleophile or electron donor. Okay, so it donates an, an, an electron to this phosphate, which is attached to our substrate. So this is a, a phosphosubstrate, okay, the substrate here, and uh, <clears throat> this substrate has been uh, phosphorylated, and now uh, it, has a, it has a phosphate group attached to it. And this catalytic residue, or cysteine, has a sulfhydryl group, which donates an electron, okay, or basically, in other words, uh, electrons are transferred from this sulfide group to the phosphate, to the phosphate group here. And also, this, this electron transfer is paired with the protonation. A protonation is a chemical reaction in which a proton or a hydrogen ion is uh, actually is added to a substrate or another molecule. This electron transferring is, is uh, paired with the protonation of the tyrosine leaving group, tyrosine leaving substrate, okay, this substrate is actually going to leave it. Um, <clears throat> this uh, electron transferring is paired with the protonation of this uh, tyrosine leaving substrate by, this, uh, by the side chains of this uh, aspartic acid. So we have an aspartic acid here, it has a side chain, um, <clears throat> it has a hydroxyl group here, and this hydroxyl group actually protonates or add a hydrogen ion uh, to this uh, substrate. And these two reactions, okay, would lead to the formation of this cysteinyl phosphate intermediate. So we have a cysteinyl, we have a cysteine uh, to which a phosphate group is attached, and this is called the catalytic intermediate or cysteinyl phosphate intermediate. And the substrate is already uh, protonated by this uh, spartic acid, so it can leave now, okay? And in the second step, two amino acid residues, one of them is <coughs> glutamine, and the other one is a spartic acid. They coordinate a water molecule, and they, uh, by doing this, they are actually going to hydrolyze this uh, catalytic intermediate or cysteinyl phosphate intermediate, okay? So when they're hydrolyzed, this, uh, this uh, phosphate, this phosphate is actually going to be removed and it's released, okay? And now we are, uh, we are left with this uh, catalytic cysteine um, and this released phosphate, okay? So in the first step, uh, we have an electron transfer from catalytic subunit cysteine 250 to the phosphate. We also have a protonation of the substrate, okay, by this aspartic acid. And the result of the step one is the formation of this catalytic intermediate. In this step, in the second step, we have uh, a glutamine and aspartic acid, uh, <clears throat> in which, uh, you know, these two are going to uh, hydrolyze this phosphate and then um, the catalytic residue, the uh, catalytic intermediate, sorry, and uh, the phosphate group is actually going to be released. Okay, so, yeah. And you can see here the catalytic cleft of uh, PTP, or the active side, and uh, this is the phosphotyrosine. This is the catalytic residue here. Okay, you can see that the, uh, the substrate phosphotyrosine is actually uh, close, the, close to the uh, cysteine 250 or uh, 215 or the catalytic residue and again note the sorry note the uh, 9.2 angstrom's depth here this depth is very important okay uh, you know what this 
substrate or phosphotyrosine is aligned and sandwiched, is sandwiched between um, this tyrosine Y45 and another phenyl phenylalanine F180. Okay, so we have a phosphotyrosine as a substrate. This phosphotyrosine is aligned and uh, sandwiched between the uh, a, 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 a tyrosine amino acid and also a phenylalanine amino acid. And this uh, <coughs> tyrosine for, uh, 45, okay, this one actually um, is responsible for creating this depth. Uh, of, of which is uh, 9.2 angstroms, okay? And so by doing this, it is actually making the PTP specific for just the tyrosine phosphate, just for this substrate. Because it is too deep, I told you, I, sh I actually showed you, it's too deep for phosphoserine or phosphothreonine, okay, to contact this catalytic residue. And uh, the reason it is 9.2 angstroms dip is because it's thanks to this uh, a tyrosine 45 amino acid. Okay, so that uh, that was how uh, PTP catalyzes the uh, dephosphorylation of protein tyrosine uh, or phosphotyrosine. So let's talk about the catalytic domain structure of uh, PPP or serine threonine phosphatase and its uh, catalytic mechanism. This is a general structure of PPP. Uh, PPP is, uh, or serine threonine phosphatase, is a dinuclear metalloenzyme. It means that it is an enzyme which has some metal ions in it, and those metal ions play a very important role in its uh, catalytic action, or mechanism, function. Well, <clears throat> so this is the general structure of it. Uh, the catalytic cleft or catalytic site has a Y shape, okay, and it is uh, characterized by a C-terminal groove, uh, an acidic groove, and a hydrophobic groove. So there is a Y-shaped uh, catalytic site. Let's talk about the cat uh, catalytic mechanism. It's, uh, it's more fun. Uh, <clears throat> so we have two enzymes. This is, this is the catalytic site. We have a substrate which is phosphorated. Uh, on its uh, serine or threonine, okay? So we have a phosphate attached to a serine or threonine of a substrate. And uh, this phosphate is now in this catalytic uh, cleft or side. We have uh, two enzymes. Uh, usually there are two, two, two ions, uh, metal ions. Usually there are uh, zinc, iron, uh, magnesium and manganese ions. Okay, so these are uh, these are the common metal ions in PPP enzymes. In this case, we have an uh, we have an iron uh, and um, uh, is it a manganese? Yeah, a manganese ion as our metals. What do they do? Well, they um, coordinate a water molecule or an hydroxide ion. Okay. So they coordinate a water molecule or an or, uh, an hydroxyl, uh, 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 hydroxide ion. And this water or hydroxide ion acts as a nucleophile. Okay. We also have a proton donor, histidine 125. Okay. This is a proton donor. It donates uh, a, a hydrogen ion or a proton to the substrate. So we have two metal ions. They coordinate, uh, in this case, uh, a hydroxide ion. It acts as a nucleophile. What does a nucleophile do? Well, it donates an electron. It donates an electron to this phosphate. And this electron donation or uh, electron transfer uh, causes uh, <coughs> the bond between the uh, phosphate and the substrate to be broken. Okay, So this uh, electron transferring breaks the bond between the phosphate and the substrate. And then the substrate is protonated by histidine 125 and leaves and this phosphate is, is then released, okay? So, 
this is what happens. Now, after the substrate is protonated by histidine 125, it leaves, and this phosphate is also released after it is pro uh, after it gets an electron from this hydroxide ion. Uh, instead of this hydroxide ion, it can also be a water molecule as our nucleophile. And these are signature sequences. You know, these are important. Um, amino acid residues, uh, conserved amino acid residues, for example, asparagine, um, uh, some aspartic acid, or aspartate, and uh, histidine 125. These, these are very important, and these are, they form a signature sequence. Uh, <clears throat> and these are conserved amino acid residues in most of the uh, PPP enzymes. Uh, and they have a very special role in, in coordinating those uh, two uh, metal ions, okay, which in turn coordinate our nucleophile hydroxide ion or the, uh, the water molecule. Okay, so that was all about the catalytic domain structure of PPP and it's uh, how it catalyzes dephosphorylation. Okay, so That was it. Uh, well, in this lecture, by 692.2, I talked about two common uh, switching mechanisms, phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. I also explained the catalytic activity of kinase enzymes and phosphatase enzymes. Thank you so much. It was a long lecture, and thank you so much for <sighs> watching this lecture. Well, um, next lecture would it's going to be the last lecture on biosignaling, in which I'm going to just explain calcium, uh, calmodulin-dependent kinase, and uh, nuclear receptors, and some, some, so, uh, yeah, those two, those are, those are uh, two of the most important things I'm going to explain in the next lecture. It's going to be a very short lecture, I mean, relatively short, and yeah, that was it. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video and this lecture. I hope you can. Uh, I hope. Uh, I wish you can watch other videos as well, other lectures as well. Thank you.